<laughs> Whenever. Uh, can you guys hear us? No. Yeah. Yes. I got one knot in the front row. What about in the back? Oh, Resounding okay. silence everywhere behind me. A little bit. Um, I heard we should be louder. We should be louder. This is the whole thing. We're just That's gonna a do dangerous this road to go down, but okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, thank you guys all so much for coming out. Thanks to South by Southwest for having us. Uh, my name is David Wolinski. I'm an entertainment journalist. I work on an oral history project called Don't Die. Uh, which is an interview series uh, attempting to humanize something that is typically treated as solely a consumer good, which is video games. So I explore a lot of conversations uh, about video games that there isn't room for elsewhere in the media real estate. And uh, that's how I wound up meeting Des a few years ago. Uh, I interviewed her. I guess you should probably talk about the project you do and how conversations persisted from there. Let go, Bo. Let Bo go first. All right. Well, Let go, Bo first. Also, there's Bo. Hi, I'm Bo. Uh, my name is Bo Pinkham. I'm with the Crisis Center of Johnson County. Uh, we're one of the core Lifeline centers for Lifeline's chat network across the U.S. Uh, our Crisis Center, um, and I won't delve into what Crisis Intervention is. We don't have time for that. But our Crisis Center sees about 1,200 contacts per month. Uh, a lot of that is it's about two thirds chat now and one third phones. I'm also on the National Board for Contact USA, which is an accrediting body for uh, crisis centers across the nation in Canada. And uh, I've been involved in crisis prevention in various ways for about 15 years. Boom. I'm Des, Desiree Stage. Um, I run livethroughthis.org, which is a series at its core of um, portraits and oral histories of suicide attempt survivors across the US. I, over six years, have interviewed 180 suicide attempt survivors. Um, including many in Austin. Um, and outside of that, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how uh, media, all media, represent suicide. Because I think that as creators, we, we get to color um, the, perspective, or the perceptions of people across the country about things like suicide, about big issues. Um, and so I think it's really important to talk about that in this space as well. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Maxwell. Uh, I work for the largest uh, national suicide prevention hotline in the country. Um, and I've been involved with, with suicide prevention and intervention for almost eight years um, in a variety of um, contexts. I serve on the board, the advisory board for ourdatahelps.org. Um, which if you get a chance, please go check it out. It is a website where you can go and uh, donate your social media data um, to help create tools uh, that will assist uh, clinicians um, with suicide prevention. Um, so that was introductions. This is who we are. Thank you all for being here. Um, and I think like we can just kind of dive right in. And we're going to be really informal with this. We're just going to kind of pass around some questions and talk about this. Um, Knowing that this is such a sensitive topic and such uh, a difficult topic for a lot of people, um, we want this to be an incredibly safe space for everybody here. Um, and if, if during our talk it brings up any feelings or emotions or anything that you want to chat with us about afterwards, feel free to come and talk to us. We'll probably be up here or out there. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that that was very clear. Um, and we're going to be as honest and open about everything as we possibly can. I guess also, too, before we get started, we were kind of curious about all of you. We weren't sure if it was going to be game developers turning out, uh, people who love video games, people who hate video games, people who know nothing about video games. Uh, no one reacted to any of that, so we still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, show of hands, developers. Okay, one in the back. What else? No, there's one there was another one yeah. up there. Oh, I didn't awesome. see. Hi. And someone pointing to that other hand <laughs> yeah. as well. I'm not sure if they're developers. People who like they're games. They're developing it's... developers. Okay, that's what so we got. Gaming okay, cool. Good. What else? Did you uh, mental health professionals. Mental health yes, professionals. obviously. Yeah. Also. There we go. Boom. Awesome. All right. This so is you... an obvious question we didn't think about. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you want to. Yeah. Parents. Parents. Parents, yes. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, one of the things that we wanted to touch on, we're going to, a lot of our stuff we'll talk about kind of like games as art, um, you know, and kind of how that field sees itself. 
to all the developers out there, all two of you and whatnot, uh, we just want to say, like, we're not telling you how to make your art. You know, art is a very personal, like, lovely thing. And when we talk about, like, guidelines later on and stuff like that, that's just generally what they are. But we're not coming down from, like, the hand of God to say, you, this is how you should do things. So just keep that in mind that this we're all very open about that. And we want to make sure, you know, you know we have very creative types. She's very creative. I've heard of it, at least. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you have ownership over what you do. We're just here to kind of inform that dialogue that you have with your creation. Cool. Yeah, our intent mainly is to explore, you know, why is this intersection not bigger? Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's do this thing. Yeah. Um, what do you guys, this question is for everybody up here. Um, what do you find appealing or helpful about there being video games to touch on subjects like suicide? I mean, I'll start off and repeat almost exactly what I said over lunch, which was, uh, you know, you can go see movies about pretty much anything you might be interested in. You can listen to music for more reasons than to just have fun. You can read books about things other than to just have fun. Um, I do think this is starting to change in video games, but again, just I think it's an interesting intersection to make be bigger to create opportunities to make people feel more comfortable exploring these types of ideas and also you know it's very important for people to see these thoughts explored in art that they appreciate and experience yeah, and we we consume differently obviously like you said movies music there the gaming community is really big and really important and this is stuff that they need to be talking we need to be talking about too in those communities um, because Right, it's not solely one community's responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So. One, of the, one of the things that, um, that I think is really helpful, especially about video games that talk about specific um, emotions or situations that someone with thoughts of suicide or depression might be going through, because there are a few of those where you actually go through a scenario where there's a, a plot line um, where somebody is going through these things and exper experiencing them in real time. Um, for someone who actually has had thoughts like that, um, it's a little bit freeing. It kind of it, it, it makes it okay to talk about it, that other people experience that, even if it's a video game, even if it's somebody through an avatar. Um, and I think on the other end, for people who haven't ever experienced those things, um, it allows us to kind of look into that life, that those experiences, um, and to, to potentially give us a little bit of a language to be able to talk with, with people who might be experiencing those things. Yeah, there's, um, you know, most of us were probably taught put yourself in someone else's shoes. If I've never been suicidal or I've never known anyone who's been suicidal, why would I want to do that? Why would that, you know, that's that's a really hard thing, a hard obstacle to, to make yourself do that. Um, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to think about being suicidal had it not been forced upon me. <laughs> Um, I'm an attempt survivor. So, yeah, I think that's that's one of those things we really struggle with. And, and having games where you are playing that character or you are playing a, a helper character who's, who's going to help someone off a, a literal ledge, I guess. Um, is it, it's figurative in a game still, right? It would be... <laughs> if you're going to help someone off a ledge... Digital. You know, it's a digital ledge. Yeah. That helps give you empathy. It forces you into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the fact that you know, think back to the last time you gamed, if you're a gamer out there, you usually felt very safe. Gaming is a safe space for a lot of us. You know, it's one of our coping mechanisms, or it's just one of the places that we have the most passion. And so seeing theme, like those more like rigorous, tougher themes, like suicide or whatnot, in that safe space is a great way for people to kind of explore that. Um, it's also a great way for like service providers and whatnot to help you explore that when you do reach out, if you need to. Um, but yeah, just uh, so it's just tremendous to see that in game season. I mean, it's part of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about the intersection of um, a couple of different things: behavioral health, um, specifically when we're looking at video games. So when we talk about video games and mental health, the only intersections are, are violence and addiction, typically. Uh, this closes up, uh, us off to important opportunities to address suicide and other mental health conditions um, in a safe and meaningful and artistic way. What do you guys think about that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's a phrasing that came from me, so I'll elaborate on that, uh, which is just something that had been told to me by mental health professionals I interviewed for my project. Uh, a woman named Kelly Dunlap, who either just finished or is currently a fellow at the American University in D.C. Um, she's exploring the intersection of journalism and video games and mental health and also both of those. Uh, she told me about how when video games and mental health are brought up, uh, it is typically for a shooting or an addiction, always something negative, but usually under those two umbrellas. So uh, that's all that's meant by that. Um, I mean, would you guys agree with that? Do you feel like you've read about um, instances where that's not the case? I mean, was it April 20th, 1999? Columbine. Yeah. Was yeah. It April 19th. Um, you know, right. their, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold played Doom, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time I really heard about, oh, it's the video game's fault that these kids killed all these other kids, or Marilyn Manson's fault. And it's just like, come on, we, we have a little bit of uh, agency here. Well, it's it's also a revisiting of just moral panics that happened in mm -hmm. movies. And Satanic panic. What? Satanic, Satanic panic. panic. Like with yeah. Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s and mm -hmm. late 70s? I thought you were talking about the hair dye. <laughs> no, that's manic, it's manic panic. It's manic panic, yeah. <laughs> Two people. So there's national implications yeah. there, too. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder too if um, suicide is a little bit of an abstract concept, especially when it comes to video games. Um, when, it, when it comes to using it as a plot point um, or a narrative device, it serves a particular purpose, but when we actually want to use it for something that can help someone or as, as a resource um, for someone who might be experiencing thoughts of suicide, it's a little bit more difficult to integrate it inside of a video game. Um, and so it's much, and, and I guess, a, a, Opposed to that, it's much easier to um, include a, a narrative of addiction or violence. Those things are things that we're pretty typical, or we're used to seeing on a on a pretty typical basis. Right. I mean, and I just clarified on the IRL intersection of these. I mean, I think I don't know if we're ready to go to the slides of the next stuff, which is the again digital sort of intersection of when video ready? games. Yeah. Let's yeah. Do All right. Let's do. Go ahead. Thing. So. Um, some games weave mental health into their storylines. These are a few that I have played that I have um, really loved. I feel like they did a really great job. How, how many people here have played Life is Strange, just out of curiosity? Everybody go check it out. Seriously, I love it so much. Um, the Mirror is also a quick uh, web-based game that is awesome. Not specifically about suicide, but really great. Um, and then Depression Quest is about depression, and I thought that was a really incredible textual depiction of, of depression and how mm -hmm. as it progresses, you lose options in your life. You, you lose the ability or the motivation to, to do things that people think are totally normal, totally easy things to do in you know, everyday life. Like, get out of bed. That's hard when you're depressed. Mm -hmm. um, but most games don't do that. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, screenshots for y'all that my brother gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so like Grand Theft Auto, I mean, you you actually have the option to kill yourself. But it's free. It, it, well, no, I think in, it's $50 sometimes. What? It's 50 or 500 There's five and some zeros. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a mathlete. <laughs> So you, you can do that in Grand Theft Auto, and I know it's a respawning thing, but can we do that some other way? Um, we have Borderlands 2. This one really throws me off because you are given the option, or you're, you're given the mission by Handsome Jack to kill yourself, and you have the options of do it or don't do it. And then it's got this crisis counseling line, and I know that this game is generally um, an off-color game. I guess would be... It's one way of putting it. Yeah. Right. Uh, that really threw me off because it, it felt like we were making fun of something that is helpful. Um, so there's that one. And then Fallout. That's, that's rough. You find this dead body and, and all of the things that you can take from it. Um, so there are those. Uh, what else do I have? So I think what we wanted to do is talk about... Oh no, we're not there yet. We wanted to talk about uh, what constitutes bad content. Like what in, in these games 
um, and others. There are a lot of mainstream games that have uh, elements of suicide in them. So what constitutes bad or maybe not useful uh, content? Well, yeah, you guys were talking about you don't. Yeah, yeah, you don't. Can you clarify on that why you don't like the term bad, or maybe that good bad binary? Well, it's that that feeling of I don't want to be telling you guys what to do. Yeah, again, like you know, art is art, and we. I'm very much at least of the opinion that all video games is art. I don't care what Roger Ebert said a long time ago. Um, He's dead. Yeah, he died. So (laughs) there you go. It's a good thing everyone was sitting down for that. Spoiler alert. Uh, so, you know, I don't think anything is bad in that, like, I just like to see the creative process and, you know, the creative process gets better every time you do it. Um, and, like, not all of these three examples are, like, the worst. You know, like, True. Fallout 4, knowing, like, the scope of that game and what goes on in there, like, that is a very real thing that that person in the, the world would encounter. Um, and you have to use some thought to figure out what's mm-hmm. going on there. You know, uh, it's not a lot of thought, but you have to kind of make some logical leaps. Well, you know, Borderlands, I laughed when that came up, and I run a crisis <laughs> center, basically. Um, so, well, we you know. We kind of have to have twisted senses of humor. Yeah, we all have morbid senses of humor if you were in the first row and heard us before this started. Um, we're very funny. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some of us. Anyway. When uh, we tell you, you laugh. See, that's <laughs> there you go. good. That's, yeah. It's working. But, there's just some things that, like, the Borderlands thing, the Grand Theft Auto thing, like, someone who's having progressively harder thoughts of suicide doesn't need to see kill yourself. Mm-hmm. And that was an intentional design choice that those people made, and I don't know why. And, you know, we could start dialogues with them, but the fact of the matter is that's something that could be very impactful to a specific person who is reading it. And that could have, as you mentioned, that could have gone any number of ways. You know, like, you just use the term respawn. Or use anything else, honestly. Uh, it's That would be my example of, like, less good. Uh, less Thank helpful. you, 1984. <laughs> Double bad. Double bad. Yeah, Double bad. Plus, yeah. um, and a lot of what we're going to be doing here and throwing these ideas around is we just want to change the way people are thinking about suicide or ask for them to maybe think a little harder. I know suicide is edgy um, and shocking and we want that. That's how we how we get people's attention. We are all naturally rubberneckers. I am the worst of the rubberneckers, I'm not gonna lie. Um, so, but how do you use that meaningfully? Yeah, uh, looking at the purpose behind any content that you include in a game is incredibly important. Like obviously for uh, for actual storylines, you want things to move in a, in a uh, logical sense. You want things to flow well. You want the feel the, the user, uh, the the video game player, to feel like they are traveling through an adventure or some sort of scenario. Um, is the is the inclusion of a suicide plotline there to do that? Is it there to cause shock? Is it there to potentially traumatize? Whatever the the, the issue is. Looking at the purpose and the intent, I think, is the most important thing. And this is when it comes to developing games. Yeah, and I don't want to make it seem like we're all wagging our fingers and saying right. games shouldn't be... I do that on Twitter. Yeah, well, it's hard to... How many characters is that? <laughs> like, uh, 140 of these. Yeah, it fits completely. Uh, yeah, I think just respectful is the word, yeah. especially when you do look out at other mediums. You know, there is interesting, provocative, thoughtful, insightful work being done. Um, It is still the same year, it's still 2017 in video game land. It's doable. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the creator, you know, and the choices they make. So, I mean, what, we have bad content, kind of, and then it, so is it better to, is it better to have bad content on suicide or no content at all? I don't know, what do you guys think? I mean, I would say no. I was throwing it out to them. I was curious if they had a thought, if they had a murmur of a thought. Is it better or worse to have? It's good. good? Why? Even if it's bad content? No. Okay. No. Quite I mean... I'd say anything that starts a dialogue, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, uh, and you know, video games are such a great medium because, I mean, you have to take ownership 
while you're playing the game of a lot of those things. The first two examples, it's not you're not just watching a movie of someone like going up and like having to kill themselves to satisfy Handsome Jack's mission, which I did. I killed myself. You get some money. Oh, um, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, you know, you're not just watching a movie. You are doing that. Um, and that's what separates video games from a lot of the other mediums. And it's fascinating to have to put yourself in that mind space. And what we're kind of asking designers to do or developers to do, if if they want, is if they want to go far, they can like talk about, you know, when I'm putting this in my video game, how do people who are going to have thoughts of suicide or going through very severe depression or whatnot, how are they going to interact with this choice? Because they're the ones making that choice. I'm just offering it to them. Um, and at the very least, if they don't want to think that far along, they could talk to someone in our field and at least try to like initiate, like, what, what do you think about this or whatnot? Hey, you're jumping ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> can we start over <laughs> on the whole talk? Yeah, we'll just, <laughs> we'll just start we'll over. We'll leave and come back. You fucked up the flow. Respond. Okay. I'm sorry. Please. Uh, but, no, that, but that, I think, you know, thinking about that dichotomy, <laughs> thinking about a little bit uh, empathetically towards the, the um, player um, could go either way. Like, is the person going to find this cathartic or is the person going to find this triggered? Mm -hmm. um, and what, where can I make this actually go? Um, you have the ability to potentially um, influence that person in that moment. Yeah, well, many people are, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. One of you said at lunch, um, you know, the game doesn't end after you've made it. Uh, yeah, I said, I said that. We all agreed, though. So. Yeah. Take credit, girl. <laughs> we all. I don't think it matters. Well, I mean, people say this about video games often that it's a medium in which you are authoring your own story, and I think mm -hmm. there's a separation between what the developer and publisher intend, and then what you, as the player, experience, because you sort of become complicit in decisions. I mean, it's sort of like when you go to the grocery store; like you think you can choose anything you want, but you can actually only choose from the things they stock. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Thank you. Anytime. I'll only so do food metaphors. Do we want to talk about some Zelda. of the games that... that yeah, yeah. yeah. it's that. obviously a little more nuanced than good and bad, as All we right. said. So, relevant to our interests here at, at the Gaming Expo, um, there are long lines to play this game right now. Really long lines. And this just came to our attention yesterday. Um, was it Br Brigo? Brigo? Brigo. 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 Um, so I guess, I don't know why Link ends up on this bridge, but at some point, he ends up on this bridge, and this actually stops gameplay, this guy, when you end up on this bridge. Um, and he stops you from, from killing yourself, or he thinks that that's what you're gonna do. And he said, please think about what you're doing, which is, okay, I guess, sure. in yeah. terms of, of, if we were gonna try and intervene in a crisis. And then the next thing is, you know, you have so much to live for, essentially. A little less good. Yeah. Less, less good, right. yes. Double less good. Double less um, helpful. Why is that? Well, let me tell you, when I'm suicidal and someone tells me all the things I have to live for, I've got one of these for them. Because <laughs> I can't feel that, I can't believe that, I am just the most useless human in the world, and I want to die. So that's, and that's something that we teach in all crisis yeah. trainings, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't say dumb things like that. <laughs> well, it's, and, and more, and just really quickly, in a more nuanced way, it's it's more about not giving them your reasons for them to live, but more about finding their reasons to live. Right, and you wanna you wanna do more listening and yeah. validating of their feelings rather than projecting your own. You know, I know there are starving children in whatever um, country, but. America. My problems are also valid. Yes, yeah. America. My problems are also valid, so don't don't invalidate that. And then, oh, here we go. Don't do that again. You almost gave me a heart attack because it's it's about me, not you, who might be a person who wants to die. And then, the awesome thing. I'll stay here and talk to you. That's exactly what people want when they're suicidal. Just someone to listen. So this game specifically really kind of it. It does the bad and the good, and it ends on the good, which is great. <laughs> and actually, uh, similarly, what we were saying about the experience doesn't end when you're not playing the game. You guys actually saw a thread about I mean, I sent yeah. the thread over, but you actually waded into the thread. Can you talk a little bit about 
yeah, no, uh, so the, the conversations that sparked. So the, the Reddit, like yesterday. Reddit, yeah, the, and it's and actually probably continuing that, today. Reading through that thread, yeah. I found out that it's actually that was a repost. It had been reposted several times. Okay, which is even more fantastic. So something like this in a in a really popular brand new game is already getting a lot of traction, um, which means that people want to talk about it, and that goes both positive and negative. Um, which is going to happen on any internet community, but it's on the biggest uh, gaming uh, subreddit, um, and so it's a default subreddit, which means that a ton of people are seeing these things. Um, and, and a lot of these kinds of conversations, and especially in, in what we noticed in this one, is that people were actually talking about their own um, experiences with depression and suicide. There were a lot of people saying, "Oh, that's really cool. You know, I'm not. I don't feel that way right now, but if I was, that would be really helpful." Um, or there were a few people who were like, yeah, that's, that's bullshit, like, I, I, I'm not gonna, like, that's never gonna happen. Uh, no one's ever gonna actually care about me when I'm feeling like that. And then somebody's like, hey man, what's going on? So then those conversations start in those threads about the video games. So we see, even outside of the video games themselves, the communities that surround the video games are full of people who are experiencing these same things, are full of people who are willing to help uh, support um, and full of people who, who want to help. Yeah. It's it's really cool to see happen in, in basically real time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when Crisis Center started doing Crisis Chat, which is actually like relatively recent, I want to say like seven years ago, was some of the first services for that. Uh, like we we learned really quickly. My center was the second in the nation to do it. Um, that like people open up way more online and in these spaces than they do either even in person or like uh, over the phone. And you know, it, it's really dictated like how we do our trainings and kind of what we have to talk about. And I'll, I'll get into that later on about how we do our trainings because I have some complaints. Um, I'll just like to. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, it, it was just, it's amazing. And so now you can, you can go onto Reddit and go on like Suicide Watch or anything like that. You can just see people absolutely at the drop of a hat open up about these things that forever was just one of those things they could never really talk to anybody about um and so like that that's how gaming just creates these spaces that are just tremendously potent um and we'll talk about later about how we'll try to get into those spaces yeah. i guess yeah. that just made me think of um the the i guess behavioral health community if we're gonna start with that um there's uh, historically kind of been a st really heavy stigma within the community about people with lived experience of suicidality or depression or whatever. Uh, you know, you, you can't put them all together because they're just going to figure out how to, how to kill themselves better, right? <laughs> but what I've found um, in my own community that I run and, and on these, like, Suicide Watch and everything is that once someone does start talking about it, people who have that experience jump in because they know they know exactly what to say. They're like, oh, I can talk to you, here's my phone number. And I mean, of course this does revolve around like, how does this person use the internet? We can either go way to the, to the scary thing, like back in the day, out suicide methods, and that's where I used to chill. Um, or we could do things like this on Reddit where we're helping each other. Um, so it is about how you use the internet, but seeing those things happen is so cool. And what's even like more impressive is that an NPC, an unplayable character, can actually have that effect on somebody. Mm -hmm. um, that they feel supported even if that isn't like a real person. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so next next game that handles suicide pretty well is um, Life is Strange. This is Kate. I believe her name's Kate Marsh. Um, and in episode two, I'm spoiling this for people of you, people who haven't played it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. First Ebert and then this. Yeah. So there's there's an, a, a story arc with Kate where she is she is suicidal and I didn't want to include this up top, but for context, you know, you, you find her on a roof, and subsequently it's your job to talk her off of that roof, which is high pressure. Um, and, and you she asks you a series of questions and you have to answer them the cor correct way, uh, and I think that also kind of follows the guidelines-ish until you get to the end. And she's like, what do I have to live for? And you're only given a list of people. <laughs> and if you choose a specific person, Kate dies. Um, <coughs> I killed Kate the first time I played. <laughs> and then I couldn't handle my life, so I went back and played it again. Uh, I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. 
I was like, I can't. I can't. Yeah. I actually talked to the the writer of the game the other day. He was here, Christian Devine, and I said, you know, how. Um, what did your research process look like? Because you guys handled this so well. And he said, well, I, I am an attempt survivor. I tried to kill myself when I was 15 in front of a room full of people, which was just so so great to hear him say that. Um, and for, for him, the process came just intuitively. That writing came intuitively. Uh, and it was, it was really beautiful. And then at the end of the episode, they gave you a hotline number. So if this triggers you, if this upsets you, call these guys. And I was like... Oh my God! <laughs> we did this thing that we were supposed to do. How cool is that? Anybody? And even, and their even their message board too is full of similar support as the other games, right? Yeah. So. so mm-hmm. I haven't chilled on the on the message board. That's okay. I just. <laughs> I think you do some other myself. relevant work <laughs> in the field. So. So so there's some like really good ways to do. Uh, do this kind of stuff. There's really good messaging that we can use and focus on um, within games and especially within communities. There's some less helpful stuff um, that some that some developer, developers have tried to, to do. Um, so how can we help? How, how can we uh, start looking at this intersection and um, asking game developers to start collaborating with um, mental health professionals, suicide preventionists, um, all of that? What do the guidelines look like? What do the guidelines look like? Yeah. What does that mean when we say guidelines? What are the non-evidence-based guidelines that we yes. work with? Uh, We're getting there. Can um, you elaborate on where you may have just lost some people? Yeah, there? No, I, I was waiting for one. We don't follow. There's the a lot of, of that, yeah. there's a lot of guidelines in the suicide prevention intervention community that we like ask people to follow. Um, and some of it's just as simple as language, you know. Uh, and you, this is one that's getting some national push, so you may have heard that we shouldn't say commit suicide because you shouldn't say commit. Just like because you say stuff like commit adultery or commit murder. Um, and we're trying to remove that kind of uh, aspect of the act of suicide away from it because it makes people shut down and not want to talk about their suicide thoughts because it's, like, it's something that's inherently horrible and wrong and awful with me um, and generally just paints me as a worse person than everyone else. Right. Um, so, you know, if we see that language in video games, it's something that we could start a dialogue on and be like, you know, there's just other language you could use. It's something something as simple as, uh, um, well, now I'm blanking. Because well, the ones we like in the field are take your own life, mm-hmm. died by suicide, died from suicide. Um, I think in, in the the community outside of ours, those kind of might not always be realistic. We're trying to get journalists to at least use those kind of words Mm -hmm. because I feel that journalists are ideally supposed to be objective, so why are we using such a colorful word word as commit? Um, But, you know, in maybe uh, I'd say applied um, approach that gamers take, you could say kill yourself somehow. That's that is still okay with with the suicide prevention people. Um, mm. I think it's fairly colorful too, but it is you know it's at least straight and to the point, and people don't they don't pull away from it so hard as you know when you tell them don't don't say commit because of all of these reasons, say this instead. And sometimes the language is clunky; it's evolving really fast. So we're still working with that. I see. What about what about something like I mean we saw Luke. Or Link, Luke, Star Wars. <laughs> we saw Link on the bridge. We saw um, uh, Katie um, on the top of the building. What about method? Is that something? How do we how do we deal with methods in, I mean, in visual in a visual realm? That's that's really. I mean, one of the running jokes in that Reddit thread is that Link could easily survive that fall because he's got a stamina bar and stuff like that. Or circle. I don't know. Whatever. You're suicidal, your stamina bar is like... Yeah, it's like, whoa, you're so close. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't know if that's like a bridge too far as far as like, I mean, video games put you in some pretty amazing places. Like, they're just going to put you in some place where you're going to be near a ledge or like have access to like firearms or other lethal weapons or whatnot. Um, I think... So, you know, yeah, I don't know if that's something that can be addressed right now. But I think I think the key word here, at least on my sheet of paper, is is this meaningful? And that's my one issue with that Breath of the Wild thing is that's the only NPC that will come up and talk to you in that game about that, and that only happens at that bridge. And so it's 
should suicide be an Easter egg in a game? Because I don't know if that it's probably not an Easter egg, but like it doesn't happen all the time. It didn't happen to everyone who played the game. You have to be there at a specific time when that NPC is going through their route and sees you there. And that's where I have an issue with that because suicide is a public health issue and it's affecting so many people's lives. It does not, it should not just be an Easter egg in a game. If you're going to have suicide or drug addiction or problem gambling or any Thing that affects people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis, I think you are doing that community a disservice by just having it as a one-and-done and, and we're never going to explore it again. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, methodology, I do, I've done enough national media to have been kind of bullied by them um, and threatened, like, oh, well, if you don't tell me how you tried to kill yourself, I'm not going to write this piece, New York Times. Um, <laughs> Sorry, not Fake sorry. News. And I rolled over and I took it because the greater good that time. But you know, now it gives Topical. me an opening. <laughs> now it gives me an opening when someone asks me about how I tried to kill myself. I could say I don't really like to talk about this. I'll tell you, but if you're going to use it, because it's not interesting. That's not the interesting part of my story. Actually, how I tried to kill myself is pretty boring. Um, what happened after is not boring. So I'm, I just basically try to say, okay, can we not romanticize it? Can we not make it gory? Can we not glorify it? Can we just, if it's got to be there, can we put it there and move right on? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously uh, not everyone who makes a game that touches on the material, like Life is Strange, will have a lived experience. Um, if they, the royal they, developers anywhere, want to make a game that touches on it, um, I mean, would there ever be any reason that you would not want to help them with their research? Because I think some of what you're actually talking about as well is there's a fear of asking a question that's too personal, mm -hmm. even though you're the one who broached it in the first place. But because obviously, ultimately, like what we're talking about here is responsibility. Um, so, I mean, what responsibilities do developers have? to their, I guess users is too cold a word, but people who wind up playing these games. Yeah, I think that's the key to that collaborative aspect, um, is that, I, and, and probably in uh, the gaming community and the gaming development community, just like, as I know it is in suicide prevention, uh, we typically have a really hard time of seeing the forest through the trees. This has been a common metaphor in our conversations this week, um, but we, we tend to get really stuck up on um, a, a few different things that may or may not have a huge impact to the larger uh, public, to the larger gaming communities. Um, and there might be things in, the, in a gaming development setting that probably wouldn't have as big of an impact in a suicide prevention or mental health setting. Um, so when it comes to collaborating, I think compromise has to be incredibly important. And I think they have to, that everybody involved has to be willing to make some concessions and look at things for the greater good and for the um, for the purpose, the meaningfulness of the art, um, and to make sure that whatever is being presented is done in the most effective and safe way. So, I mean, where is the line? When does it become censorship? Um, I had, uh, I guess I'll, I have a note here to tell the story now, I guess I can. Um, I had spoken, I would spoke to a developer uh, in anticipation of this panel, sort of getting a sense of just a random developer's opinion about video games that touch on uh, suicide or sensitive topics. And he was of the opinion that if you engineer a piece of entertainment to result in a desired effect, takeaway, reaction, that it is basically making propaganda. Uh, and I know we all disagree with that, but... <laughs> If you could elaborate on why you disagree. I mean, let's just not watch TV or read books or listen to music or listen to podcasts or play games, then. So what's left? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the stories are in the fire. Can you eat ketchup? <laughs> you can eat ketchup, maybe. Yeah. 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 Is ketchup out, too? Ketchup gives ketchup's me feelings. Ketchup's got to be out. Yeah. 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 It hurts tomatoes. So. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, do you, do you think that that's overstating it, saying it's propaganda? Do you think, I mean, is there a line at all? Art elicits reactions, emotions, um, incentivizes and motivates you to do things. Absolutely, there's there's no question that um, 
video game developers, people who play video games are going to have um, reflections of the human experience um, when they are, are going through this, this storyline. So, um, no, I think that's irresponsible to call it propaganda. I think we have a certain responsibility to everybody that might be coming in contact with these games to um, keep ethics in mind and then to also keep someone's safety in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of regressive and irresponsible to handle the material insensitively, and I don't think that makes you a prude to want to say that. It's just, I mean, you wouldn't want to have something that deals with something you've experienced with, uh, in an overly simplistic or even stereotypical way. I mean, really, what is propaganda? I came back from Havana a month ago. Let me tell you about propaganda. <laughs> you get no choice. That is what you see. That is what you consume. Asking someone to follow a set of guidelines or to even think differently about a storyline that they might include in their game is not propaganda because you have a choice. Do we want to do questions now, or do we, what do we want to do? Can we, can we wait till the end? Yeah, yeah, would you mind waiting until the end? We have, uh, we're we're going to have 10 minutes. Okay. It'll be first. Yeah, we're we got eyes on you. <laughs> we're not going to make you stand in front of that mic. We'll call on you. <laughs> or if you want to stand until the end, you can. Let's go to the back of the room. We can keep it rolling if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Um, so, do we want to go to the next hard question? I don't know. Are we still on propaganda and censorship? I, do we you have all, I mean, we also we disagree, but I, I just... And then you, both, you, then you both looked at me like I had raised the question. <laughs> yeah, no. No, David, you're wrong. <laughs> do we disagree? Do, do you have any thoughts? No, I don't. It? You don't have to. No, I think you all just speak for me, which is wonderful. Okay, we're going to take Bo's microphone away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even need to be here. I think we can puppet. press on. Is that sure. Okay, fine. Um, this, here's, here's you, Bo. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, what, what we're, we're trying to find out is how do we bridge this gap? Um, between developers and, and experts on these these mental health issues, specifically suicide for us. How, how do we be friends? Yeah, um, so first of all, the video game industry should answer its dang emails um, because, <laughs> no, I mean sincerely, like I, it, there's a lot, uh, David could speak to this. Yeah, too. I was gonna like, like literally just dive in, yeah, or go, metaphorically, go digitally yeah. dive in. Go uh, nuts. Nobody go nuts. Okay, okay. hold on. I know it says we have no answers up there. I did before. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I mean, video game easy. companies uh, are reluctant to talk about video games in a way that is not in service of selling video games. That sentence would have been really empty if I didn't use the word video games. Um, and especially when it comes to these types of sensitive topics, uh, I think there's a reluctance to they don't want to be on the wrong side of things. And so... There's a pervasive attitude of silence, which uh, has been fairly dominant in video game culture and industry the last few years we've especially seen. Um, so that's why they're not going to answer your emails. Or are you still on AOL? Or Ouch. <laughs> I mean, is that wrong? Like, is that no, there is no wrong, there is no wrong ISP. It's free. I'm open-minded about that. They send me CDs. But what emails have you been, <laughs> what emails have you been sending out other than uh, I mean, why they should know, subscribe to AOL? Yeah, there, I mean, there's just, I try to, one of the things I wanted to do is I want to see, you know, every time, like, a AAA video game gets released, a forum gets created around it that has probably minimum 500,000 users. And some of those are one and done, so they just want a question answered about the game. Um, but a lot of them start their own, like, communities. And there's actually a really good textbook called uh, Spontaneous Communities, and it's all about how MMOs and video games kind of just develop these communities around them. And so I wanted to talk to, you know, the forum managers or community managers and just be like, do you have, like, metrics on how many times people, like, directly mention that they're having, like, mental health issues, thoughts of suicide, something like that, anything that could, because we are starved for data in a lot of different ways in the suicide prevention community. That's why we started an entire org about, you know, donating your social media data. And Ourdatahelps.org. Ourdatahelps.org. Um, what was that website again? Ourdatahelps.org. It's data. Data? Data? Um, like and a so, father? like a father. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> and you know, these community managers keep their email like away from everyone because they don't want to be bothered. Like even at a work email, like they just they do everything on their forums. And I haven't gone to the point where like I've made a you know 
account on these forums just to be like, hey, community managers, can we talk about suicide? Because like that's, that's probably not going to work. Um, and I was told by some people with Penny Arcade who were really nice and actually did respond to email, so go Penny Arcade, uh, mm -hmm. that I should probably tweet at them until like they notice me, basically. It's kind of the best way to get in touch with these community managers. And I understand that they do a lot of work. You know, they're, they're sifting through a lot of stuff, and they have to deal with some pretty irate people when bugs happen and stuff like that. But, like, that's just not, that's not workable on our end of things. And what we need is better gatekeepers in the, the video game community so that we can, like, try to start these dialogues. Yeah, it sounds like they're almost responding to you as a customer. Yeah, I mean, with a complaint. Are. Yeah, basically. Or a concern. But if you get on Twitter and you complain as a customer, I can tell you I've gotten a yeah. lot of free pizza from Domino's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that has to do with how so many followers you, you have. You just though, adopt some like Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I hate Twitter so that will never happen. But what do you, what do, you hate. do when they answer, though? Like, what, what happens yeah. when, you, when, you, when you're the dog that catches the car? Cry tears of joy. Yeah. I mean, you know, Penny Arcade, like, emailed me back within days, and I was like, oh, my God, glory be. Um, and so I just immediately <laughs> just like tried to like get as much information as possible out of them but it's again it was pretty much a dead end because it was their child's play people uh, which is a charity for like getting video game and other game stuff to children's hospitals and stuff it's a great charity uh, but you know like so their access to these other people is pretty limited and they're not going to just drop emails to me because I they don't I, even if I have like a great signature and a work email and stuff like that they don't know me from Adam um, Guys, we have five minutes left. Yeah, okay. I was gonna two skip, more questions. I was gonna, I was gonna skip ahead because the other side of the digital road is, uh, you know, your guys' proverbial yeah. community. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about how the suicide prevention community is silent on gaming? Yeah, uh, as far as I know, the suicide prevention community does not have any set. Um, viewpoint on suicide prevention and gaming. I mean, it's um, difficult to define these communities as sure. anything more than a nebulous connection of pockets on the internet. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the the main stakeholders, like uh, yeah. just the largest crisis lines and stuff like that, it, it, you know, we do assist applied suicide intervention skills training at our center. It's the the training that SAMHSA, the federal uh, body that usually governs mental health and stuff like that. They're going to be gone soon. Sure, yeah. Um, they tell us that it's their best practice <laughs> training. And I've, I've been training Assist now for like two, three years. I love Assist. Assist basically pretends the internet doesn't exist. Like, it doesn't at all mention any kind of like digital way that you might get in touch with people. It just pretends that all your interactions with a person at risk for suicide is going to be in person, that you probably know them in some capacity, uh, or that they've reached out to you uh, if you're a crisis line worker. And that's not good enough anymore. And it's frankly ridiculous. Um, they also don't answer my emails, but uh, that's okay. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things that I think uh, suicide prevention, the, the industry needs to realize, and I think it's starting to realize this in a couple of other settings, um, but people who have thoughts of suicide who deal with depression and mental health issues exist inside these communities, whether, whether we, the suicide prevention people, are there or not. And so it is really important for us to be in those places, um, to be collaborating with developers and having some open communication about what we can do to try to help. Um, and that's, I think, what we can try to do, is try to push our, push our industry more and more towards trying to to look at interdisciplinary collaboration um, and working together. It's, and, oh, and go ahead. There are a lot of caveats to that, obviously. I could spend, we could spend three yeah. hours on why this is a problem funding, for one. Do you guys want to stay three more hours? Yeah. <laughs> how much time do you We're have? We're having fun. I don't know. We have a sleep I don't know how to interpret a laugh. Is that a yes or a no? <laughs> no. It's a yes. It's, it's a no. no. It's, it's a definitely a no. no. It's a hard no. <laughs> I'm tired. It's a hard yes. <laughs> well, we can continue without you. I don't want to. But. Sorry. So that's that's collaborative. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, we're working together in harmony here. Yeah. That's what that is. Just I mean, there's just you. there's so many, video games create so many spaces. Out of all media types, they just create more and more spaces. And it, video games are the ones that are continually pushing technology forward. Like I don't care what James Cameron says with Avatar. Like it's it's all video games. And we talk. We haven't even mentioned like VR, and if VR blows up, which I don't know if it will or not, but if it does blow up, that's its own thing. That's like just crazy. What? She's writing me. 
I'm ready they to see notes like doing. we're in high school here. Um, I was just going to um, toss out, because I don't know if this is stuff you already mentioned, but you had mentioned some resources. Maybe you already oh, yeah. did. Sort of. So guidelines um, mostly don't exist. We have guidelines for reporters, really. Um, but, you know, we can put on our thinking caps when we look at those guidelines, and you can find that at reportingonsuicide.org. If you want to take a look at the what we're kind of asking people to do when they're uh, talking about suicide in media. Um, and then, obviously, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is... Which is, which is at uh, suicideprevictionlifeline.org. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also reach a, a chat service through there as well, crisis chat. What about the phone number? Uh, the phone number is 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. And that's, the, that's got the veterans line, the NFL line, and the regular people line. <laughs> regular people. The, the normies. The normie one. Yeah. The normies. The normie uh, ones. And then Trans Lifeline is at translifeline.org. The Trevor Project is at the trevorproject.org. What's your website? My website is livethroughthis.org. My buzzer says we are Q&A time. Q&A time. Uh, I'll just toss this out there because I didn't mention, but uh, my project strives to explore. If you guys want to start lining up for Q&A while I finish this. Uh, yeah, my project strives to explore a lot of just conversations about video games and other types of intersections. Uh, so you can just check that out at nodontdie.com. There's a slide about it too, so they'll be able to. Find cool. It. You guys can read. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm here because I'm on Seth Turner. I have a five year old, about a year ago. I asked my child, where would you like to travel? The answer, I'm from Peru, South America. The answer he gave me was Disneyland. And I was like, well, how about we go to a place where the children play all day? Where you go, you see the streets, and it's filled with children. And after the work schedule, it's also filled with parents playing with the children. That's Havana, you mentioned Havana. And uh, my main point being, is that, uh, and Mr. Walensky, I'm probably mispronouncing you. Yeah, no, you got it right. Brought up uh, how about a society with you no know, video games. And as far as Cuba goes, people are not on uh, People come with their, their thing. They're very much into sports, socializing. And uh, you, I mean, if anyone's been there, you will see the streets filled with kids playing. Like, I've never seen that anywhere else in the West, except for when I was a kid in Peru, before video games, people uh, children were playing in the streets. And so how about if uh, video games were crafted in such a way that uh, they invited the kids to actually socialize? If they were crafted in such a way that they turned it off, go out, move, go out, play, go out, eat uh, food that will make you a little, make your mind healthier. So perhaps you don't think that much about depression and loneliness. That's my question. Thank you. So can you uh, just succinctly state what your question is? Well, I think, I think and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're getting at is, is this idea that um, a lot of people who play video games are, tend to stay inside all the time. There's a lot that they, they, they don't move very much. They're very sedentary. They may isolate. Um, they're not connecting with other people as, as well as uh, people who go out and do uh, things and play um, outside. Yes, there seems to be something inherent to video games that leads right. to people to solitude. Right. I mean, Pokemon Go. You know, a lot. I met a lot of people yeah. playing Pokemon Go myself, walking around, going out into the world. Um, it tells you how far you've walked. That was, I think, a step in that direction. Uh, and if you're taking it back to like when I was a teenager and when the internet was just kind of starting to be a thing, we were isolating ourselves and playing these games, but then we were also literally picking up our giant computers and going to other people's houses to play the games together at LAN parties and drinking balls. And, and manic panic, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I'll also throw out there, uh, there's a game coming out later this summer called Walden, being made by Tracy Fullerton, who heads up USC's games department. I had to Google it because I'll just read it, but it's a uh, first-person simulation of the life of American philosopher Henry David Thoreau during his experiment in self-reliant living at Walden Pond. You mentioned the New York Times before. They also recently wrote about it. I don't know if it's fake news, as Bo oh, just said. Um, Tracy but you contain c- multitudes? Tracy contains multitudes. Oh, I've so. met her. Um, and so that game has been lauded uh, for intending to spark an interest through a video game of actually going outside. It seems kind of circuitous to play a game to go outside, but it might be a push to get people, especially children, interested in experiencing a world without screens? Does anyone remember that? Yes. It sucked. Well, we also have, I just what, had to read that off my phone. We had what? We have geocaching still. Nobody does geocaching. It's not too Fine. bad. It's my hobby. It's a 2007 CIF. CIF. Oh, excuse me. Right, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you Thanks for your question. This is wonderful. Um, I would love to talk to you all more about resources at some point, but I think a question that would be more helpful for the wider room is something that you mentioned about uh, catharsis versus triggering and the different experiences that create one experience over another. I'm going to be, I started a nonprofit that's going to use video games, play in a group setting. We're going to be targeting at risk youth. I'm very concerned about trying to find the lines between those things. We are using more artistic, more indie video games that cover more serious subjects. Life is strange, it's on my list, but I worry. I'm not certain that I can control the variables in that situation, which would either help or hurt. Yeah. Could y'all speak to that for me? I, I think I think that setting is awesome. I, I love this idea. Um, the idea that you can actually have a group of people in the same room, not isolating and talking about this as you're going through it, that allows you to have some, some um, that, that gives you some didactic room there after you experience something like that where you can cover uh, what that person went through, maybe debrief everybody's emotions in the room, talk about some um, positive coping skills, resiliency, those kinds of things. Um, directly related to that. And I think this might go towards kind of uh, parents too. Uh, I know that was one of the the demographics here in this room. If you're not in that kind of group setting, um, it might be a good idea to open up that line of conversation with your child about not just the violence and the the sex and the nudity and the the drugs that they're experiencing in in the video games that they're playing, but suicide as well, suicide, depression, mental health, um, and open up those lines of communication because these are things that people are experiencing in video games now. Um, so opening up those lines of communication and hopefully having those kinds of didactic relationships after, the, um, after they, they play those games. Yeah, and especially with a game like Life is Strange. I mean, I didn't stop talking about it for a week. I still talk about it all the damn time. And when you're playing it, it's one of those games that people want to watch you play, too. Like, my wife was like, oh, shit. Okay, so you made this decision. I'm going to play it again later, and I'm going to make this decision. And I think we can't understate our enthusiasm for that game, because I don't think this panel would have happened uh, (laughs) if I hadn't told you to check it out. That is true. Um... So we'll be outside, I think, still able to talk. We have one more question after, but thanks for asking. Just want to make sure we get to everyone. Thank you. Hi, this is um, just a quick question for you all. Um, how would you feel like the help bridge the gap between like censorship and um, just helping to bridge the gap between um, people from and people who live in the game? Um, depending on what type of game it is, what do you guys think about the option of um, just like letting people know ahead of time that there's graphic content in the game. I remember um, one game in particular, one of the people I worked with too, that there's little image in particular, um, which had you um, doing certain activities that might be triggered for some people. And if you feel like that would be a good solution or all that to be like one first step that could, you know, progressively get, you know, more things. I think it would be a continuation of what I guess this goes back to the 90s with the, ES- yeah, with the ESRB. Right? Yeah, with the ESRB. Where, I mean, it used to be a little more childish in video games where they had its like thermometers on the box. <laughs> Do you remember that? Where yeah. it would be like, uh, this has a fever of five for violence and a fever of three for sex. So I think that, that and now they've just done like letters like we see on TV mm-hmm. in the upper left. So I think I would posit that 
this is already midstream on that sort of stuff, so I don't feel like it's overstepping anything. But I suppose I'd kick it to you guys for, like, what would be preferred um, terminology or I don't know. stuff I, to look people, out for. People have lots of fifis about trigger warnings. Um, so I call them content warnings. I think a content warning is fine to let people know what they might walk into because PTSD, while we like to reduce it to vets or maybe rape victims, like, at best, it happens to a lot more people than we even know about. And people can't recognize trauma often if they've been through it. You know, if you have a visceral reaction to something, you might not have had access to care or whatever it might, might be, but you might not know what's happening and that could harm you. So I'm never against content warnings of any kind, but I do think it would be kind of maybe a first step. It's 4.30, yeah. do, we, do we need? Can I just applaud you guys? I really, I mean, I was, Sort of kidding, but I really do appreciate your guys yeah, participating. Yes, you can clap for me. That's okay, cool. Said. Right. Thank you. And obviously, uh, thank all you for coming out. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.